Um, so yes, these aren't my pants. Uh, so uh, as, as Margie mentioned, I am the founder of 21 Toys. We're a uh, company that designs toys that teach empathy and failure. Uh, and our toys are used in uh, about 1,000 schools and over 100 companies. And uh, these are actually photographs of me at various events in other people's outfits. So uh, that is a photograph of me. Uh, I am also at City Hall. That's in a, a roommate's outfit. Uh, that's uh, my sister's skirt. And that's the founder of Atari in the bottom right corner. Uh, and the mayor of Toronto in the bottom left corner. So. The reason why um, I'm not necessarily wearing my own pants is because I've been bootstrapping my own startup for over uh, four years now. And um, the reason why I am speaking to people like the founder of Atari and um, at places like City Hall is because uh, over the last four years of bootstrapping my own business, um, we've been able to uh, have some pr pretty exciting uh, impact. So the uh, empathy toy, which I think we're most known for, um, is actually um, being used in a number of schools to uh, educate students as well as teachers on uh, the use of empathy, uh, not just in the way that students work with each other, um, but also in the way that uh, staff can actually help each other. Uh, and much like that, uh, looking at organizations, uh, we're actually able to support and help them in better understanding their customers and better understanding each other. Um, the reason why I am borrowing clothes is because uh, this is kind of a, a little gif I'm going to use. So that's, that's me-ish, uh, slash most businesses are, or uh, entrepreneurs who are starting their own company. Um, and what I'd like to say is that you're kind of this uh, train station for money. And so when you get, let's say, your, your first sale or you're getting um, that first big break, uh, it's, it's really exciting. You, um, you know, you're able to get uh, money to, to pay for certain things. But no matter how much money you're getting, especially at the beginning, um, you're kind of this train station. So while you see it and you're like, whoa, that's a lot of money, and then it kind of goes by you, and then you're just kind of waving, and, and then sometimes it comes back. Um, but mostly you're just at this station and you're just kind of seeing that, that go past you. And, and for some of us that could be a few months and for some of us that could be a number of years. Um, so uh, the journey that I've had has been a lot of standing at a train station and being really excited to take you know, whatever, whatever it has come, come our way and, and being able to pass it on to something else with the idea that one day it might actually stop at that station, even for a little bit. Um, so to take you back a little bit into how, um, how I started 21 Toys, um, I'm going to talk about um, uh, back in the time when I, I used to wear my own pants. Um, so I'm really sticking with this pants metaphor, so I hope everyone's okay with that. <laughs> I have made a pants graph. Um, so the, uh, the y-axis is kind of the idea of maybe what a certain person would be making. So we've got student closer to the bottom with, let's say, doctor kind of near the top. Um, and then the, uh, the x-axis is the perceived business success, so we're going to call that PBS for short. Um, and the, where I was at in the year 2010 was that in the pants graph, um, I was uh, just a, a recent student. So we'll table that, that'll be in the corner. Um, so where I was at in 2010 is um, I had actually studied industrial design, which is product design. And so for those of you who don't know uh, how product design works is that you essentially learn the design process. Uh, you learn manufacturing, you learn marketing, um, you learn psychology, and you really are becoming an expert in creating something and in inventing something. And uh, in 2010, I was a recent grad, and I was actually working uh, as a lighting designer. So these are uh, photographs of me uh, with a few of my friends celebrating uh, light that I designed um, being released in a very fancy fancy store in Montreal uh, called Zone. Um, and where I was at at that point in my career was that um, while it was exciting to be working as a designer and to be able to create and invent things, uh, it just felt really, really disconnected um, for what I believe design could do and the way that design could uh, you know, affect the world. Uh, design has a lot to offer and making fancy, expensive lights uh, didn't seem to be really uh, the, the best use, I thought, of, of design. So, what I ended up doing is that um, in that year, I actually decided to uh, quit my job. Uh, and I actually moved in with circus performers, which wasn't exactly the plan, but it, that, I went with it. Um, but essentially, I lived in a community of, uh, of artists. And um, I got an artist grant to kind of launch what my business would be. Um, and so essentially, what that ended up happening is, um, so I, I went a bit broke. So the, the pants graph has now dropped a little, if anyone's paying attention to the right corner. <laughs> 
Um, so why did I why did I do that? Um, so the reason behind why um, I kind of left that world, and I'm sure there's a room of a lot of people who who maybe were working for other people or working for other companies decided to go on it on their own. Um, my passion and my um, my frustration and my um, my excitement was really around the education system. And specifically, I wanted to change education with toys. And so during that time, um, not sure how many of you are familiar with uh, Sir Ken Robinson, um, but this is uh, one of the most viewed TED Talks, I think, uh, at this point. I was listening to, to TED, so I was listening to online uh, talks, and this one on how schools kill creativity really hit home. And so the reason why that re resonated with me so much was I was uh, in school, I worked really, really hard. Um, I'm actually originally from Winnipeg, and I love Winnipeg, but I really wanted to get out of Winnipeg. And I knew that the only way that I could do that was to get a full scholarship. So I worked very, very hard uh, to get into uh, the program, uh, the industrial design program. Um, but then very recently, very quickly realized that being good at school had very little to do with being good at work, or life for that matter. Um, and then I kept revisiting this toy. So the empathy toy um, that is now the, the, the first product uh, for the company that I started, the empathy toy actually was my thesis project in university. And so I uh, originally designed it for the visually impaired community. That's a photograph of me with the uh, former president of the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. Uh, and Euclid uh, and I uh, worked together to kind of get a better sense of what the visually impaired community, what challenges they face. And what I discovered was specifically with children is that there is a huge social and emotional gap between visually impaired um, students and their sighted classmates. So um, through uh, an eight month design process, I, I essentially uh, came up with the Empathy Toy, which is a blindfolded puzzle game where one or more players <clears throat> are given a built pattern and they then need to describe that to another player so they can re recreate it. A lot of my testing was actually not just done in schools, but it was done in my studio uh, with sighted adults. And that's when I saw the opportunity for uh, this product not just to be used uh, exclusively within the visually impaired community, but it was actually inclusive. And so not just with students, but with adults. And um, now um, at, at this point, so we're going back to, we're going to let's say this last year, at that time, what I was thinking about was really about this idea of education and creativity and formally what is now being really understood, especially right now, is statistics like this. So the Future of Jobs report uh, from 2016 um, essentially stated that 65% of children entering primary school are not going to be working in jobs that exist. So <clears throat> children that are in school now are being trained for jobs that they don't even know will yet exist. Um, looking at where skill sets are now going, um, by 2020, if you can see, uh, creativity and emotional intelligence are now some of the top skills. Specifically, creativity is actually one of the top three skills needed by workers. Um, and emotional intelligence is now becoming one of those top skills as well. So the work that we're doing and what, what part of our success is that um, the work that we're doing around the empathy story is very much aligned to what LinkedIn, Slack, the, the founder of Slack is the co-founder of Flickr, and the Harvard Business Review are saying the number one job skill is empathy. Um, so it's really, it's, it's quite exciting, and that gives you a little background into why we're doing this and, and how it's kind of taken off. Uh, the Harvard Business Review uh, specifically says that companies actually that invest in empathy and empathy training uh, actually find a 50% return on, on earnings, which would be a slide, but I'm not gonna write it, that like empathy equals money. But there is, <laughs> there is a case to be made, uh, not just for, for working on uh, working together better, better understanding your customers, um, but really empathy is an incredibly, incredibly powerful tool. Um, so to go back to the pants graph, um, in 2010, uh, because of uh, all, all of those things, I, I uh, uh, quit my job, I got a $1,200 artist grant, um, and then I used that essentially to get prototypes. So these are the early iterations of the empathy toy. Uh, these were made um, with uh, silicone molds that I used with a friend who had a, sh a shop who's a jewelry designer, uh, and I cast plastic. Um, I uh, was working with one of our, uh, I ended up having on my own, I, I brought on a, a design intern from, uh, from Carlton, and she worked with uh, one of actually the circus performers, uh, is also a videographer. And so uh, we were able to work on uh, this video that we continue to use to explain our, our company. Uh, we made a whiteboard video with a real 
uh, whiteboard. Um, and then probably the best investment that I had left was I ended up buying two tickets to two conferences. And so one of them is the Feast in New York, uh, which is all about social entrepreneurship. Uh, and the other one is called BitNorth. And BitNorth at the time um, was actually also, I was living in Montreal, and it's uh, the Montreal tech community. And I'm not sure if it's on hiatus or they're still doing it, but it was an incredible weekend where I got to meet with other social, with other uh, startup uh, entrepreneurs. And because of that conference, uh, to attend, you have to present. And because I was uh, able to be there and present, uh, I ended up actually getting booked to give a TEDx talk on the story of the empathy toy. Um, definitely, that's a very specific case study. But um, the amount of uh, benefits that I got in the early years in terms of going to conferences, meeting with communities, getting the opportunity to talk about my ideas and my projects uh, initially were, were a fantastic avenue to, uh, to start um, what is now uh, where we're at now. Um, so after the TEDx talk, if you see the, the pants, let me just do that again if anyone missed it. So on the, the XY graph, um, again, we are like, the, in terms of investment or anything, we, we, we're pretty much, um, we're, we're at the same level, but in terms of the perceived business success, the perception of how we're doing, something like the TEDx talk or that kind of avenue uh, was incredibly beneficial, and I'll, I'll loop back to that in a minute. Um, so just to give you a little context for how much work kind of uh, sometimes can go into just crafting a business, I definitely started from the idea of I had a product, how do I create a business around it? Um, so I actually ended up working uh, and moving to the UK, working in a design consultancy. I was in Helsinki for a minute. I'm happy to go further into that in Q&A if anyone has questions. Um, but I ended up actually in Toronto. And the reason why I landed in Toronto is for uh, really two big reasons. Uh, my best friend at the time was working uh, as a social entrepreneur at the Center for Social Innovation. If anyone here isn't familiar with it, it's a co-working space for social entrepreneurs. Um, it is an incredible community of supportive entrepreneurs from all walks of life. Um, and she let me sneak in with her for at least a month uh, to use her, uh, her workspace. Uh, they now have three locations in Toronto and one in New York. Um, but that was really the beginning of me, me seeing that. I also attended a conference uh, at the Mars Discovery District, uh, which kind of validated everything that we were doing. Um, so once I decided to move to Toronto, um, I just snuck into as many conferences as possible. So um, I volunteered. Um, I would show up. I would take the one prototype that I had, and I would leave it on a table. And then I would walk away. And then I would just wait for other people to kind of gather around and start asking, whose is this? Um, and it was, <laughs> it was a great way to organically uh, connect and talk to uh, specifically other educators. Um, what ended up happening is because of one of those conferences and one of the uh, educators I connected with, um, he ended up actually mentioning us to a school board who then found me on Twitter and became our first customer. So we, uh, just about three months into moving to Toronto, I ended up getting uh, our first uh, customer, which was a school board in Toronto, and they uh, were able to actually put in a, a really, really substantial order. Um, the exciting thing about that is because I was bootstrapping, again, no investors or anything, I just had a very clear uh, <laughs> answer to them, which said, great, I'm really excited that you, you want to get these toys. I'm going to need you to pay upfront in full, and they'll be ready in like six months, probably. <laughs> um, luckily, uh, it was at the end of the school year, and um, they agreed. And so uh, it was... <laughs> Um, it, it was an incredible opportunity not just to fulfill their order, but to actually um, triple our order so that we could have inventory. Uh, in that same month, uh, we actually won three awards. Um, so just to give you context, we got our first big customer, and we got three awards, and I am sleeping on my best friend's couch at this moment, borrowing her outfits, just for context. Um, so on the uh, pants graph, this was a really good month. Uh, we, uh, this was the first time I got validation that you know, schools would even listen to us. At that point, I thought, it's going to take 10 years. They're going to need a, a lot more uh, research and a lot more um, anecdotes. But they saw it in action, and they were able to say yes to making that first order. Um, to give you a bit more context, and I definitely encourage everyone to look into these, any of the entrepreneurs in the room, um, the uh, sale that we got uh, was one part of it, but the Center for Social Innovation has a Youth Agents of Change program, and so we were able actually to get free rent for the year, and we got mentorship. 
Uh, we also got the first loan was the Youth Social Innovation Capital Fund, uh, specifically for social entrepreneurs. It's a two-year $10,000 loan. When we got it, I believe that is still the case. Uh, and then the Spin Master Innovation Fund, which uh, is actually uh, through Futurepreneur and BDC as well as partners. Uh, that was uh, an enormous, enormous help, not just in the uh, um, $50,000 loan, but in the mentorship and support from that business. Spin Master is an incredible Toronto uh, success story. They're over 20 years old, uh, started by a group of Torontonians, um, and they are one of the largest toy companies in the world. And that was just by fluke. Uh, it is not meant to necessarily be uh, an award for a toy company. Um, but they have mentored both us as well as other organizations and, and just been an incredible support system. Um, so as great as that month felt, um, I was so excited to invest that money. So I uh, used that then to get toys and team. So I ended up bringing on uh, to, I brought on an educator. Uh, onto our team and a coder, uh, and I put in our first production run. So just so you can remember the train station, uh, this, is, this is us essentially um, being really excited about that, um, but again, you're, this, you're kind of a vessel for it. So I said, wow, that's a lot of money, and then it just kind of went through me, and then it went to pay for those things. And so um, again, with kind of looking at the, the PBS on that, um, our, our company is slowly growing and we're really getting a lot more validation. Um, but in terms of actual, um, the funding and money, money is coming is coming in, but it is going through. Uh, and as most of you might know, especially as you're building up, sometimes uh, it actually ends up uh, t costing you a fair bit. Um, so that was me just waving and excited and hoping it came back. Um, so what's pretty uh, exciting about that year is that we were able to use that money uh, not just to create our product, but actually to invest in um, empathic research. Um, and so we took the one of the teachers that we'd hired and we actually went to the first 50 schools using our toys. And what we discovered was that the toys weren't just being used um, by guidance counselors, they were being used by the language uh, teachers, they were being used to teach business, they were being used in the maker space, uh, maker spaces. Uh, and the two other thing is the toys actually would go missing. Uh, a lot of schools are saying they couldn't find them and that's because a lot of teachers are taking them home to play with their kids and play with their families. Uh, the other insight we had was that we were going in to demonstrate the toy to these teachers and realized they're actually, this is more like a professional development workshops. And that when we realized that there was an opportunity to do workshops with on empathy uh, with organizations. So with all of that uh, research, and we spent about a year doing that um, and developing that community, uh, much like uh, our last speaker, we also ran a Kickstarter campaign. Um, we were able to um, tell the story of our empathy tour. Um, and unlike a few people definitely need three to four months, I think some serious investment uh, to, or, or some serious planning to launch a Kickstarter. Um, because we, uh, I've, I've been bootstrapping this company, um, every minute, every day uh, has, uh, for at least those first uh, two to three years, were highly uh, stressful and we had very small windows. So we actually had two weeks uh, to plan and then launch our Kickstarter. Uh, so we thought that was crazy, uh, but at the same time we realized that we'd actually been building that campaign for at least two years. Uh, so we said, okay, we're just going to do it. Uh, and we were lucky enough, we, we beat our goal. Our goal was 45000 We made over 53000 in sales, uh, and we got 467 new customers. And so once again, that was amazing and incredible and exciting, but again, it's all of that goes directly into the production costs. Um, all of that goes straight from us to pay for the, the product that is then going straight to our customers. Uh, one note to Kickstarter specifically, if anyone in the room does have an organization or a product that would benefit for that, Kickstarter was incredible. Uh, not only did it connect us with our first customers, um, but we actually got a number of press. So um, we're in Fast Company, Forbes, um, a, a lot of the, the large uh, press. Our Probably our biggest milestone to date was Time Magazine. Um, and they actually contacted us. So. They emailed us, they saw our Kickstarter campaign, and they featured us as one of six new technologies shaping future classrooms. And so while for a small uh, startup, that's a huge milestone, the more exciting thing is that a wooden toy for empathy with no electronics is being called a future technology. And so that was a, a really, really incredible moment for us. 
Um, and in terms of our, our pants graph, um, you know, it started to do a bit better. So our, our perceived business success is, is slowly starting to match with what is actually happening internally in terms of just funding and, and what kind of monetary support we're getting. So um, for those of you in the room, like I mentioned before, these are uh, a number of the award loans that we've, uh, we've pursued. So um, for we've, I think we have about 16 uh, awards. Four of them have been award loans. Uh, so the two that I mentioned before uh, are the U Social Innovation Capital Fund and the Spin Master Innovation Award with Futurepreneur and BDC. Uh, we also got the Ontario Micro Loan, so through partnership and help with Alterna Bank, uh, you're able to get between fifteen or twenty-five thousand uh, dollars in loans. Um, and then most recently, uh, just this year, because I said, okay, that's enough with the award loans, we got one more, uh, which was the CEO Radical Generosity Award. Can I see a show of hands? Who here is familiar with CEO? All right. Oh, that's actually pretty good. Um, so CEO is just in its second year. Uh, we were just at their summit. I was just at their summit yesterday. Uh, it is an award loan that has been, uh, uh, it's essentially built to uh, support women-led businesses. Uh, and their model is quite radical. So they have uh, now, over the last years, they've had 1,000 women in Canada and 500 in the US each donate $1,000 to create a giant pool to then be loaned out to um, five or 10 companies at a time. So I was in the first cohort of five, uh, and it was a pool of $500,000. It's a five-year interest-free loan with mentorship and support in a community. Um, and then we actually uh, spent a weekend together meeting each other, getting to know each other, and then we had to negotiate amongst ourselves how to divide it. So we had to know our businesses, we had to know each other's businesses, and we had to advocate why we would get a certain amount. And the only two rules were, it can't be divided evenly, and it can't all go to one venture. So I'm happy to answer questions about that as well later. Um, but that was an incredible support. Um, and again, it helped us to, to build our, our team and, and toys. Uh, other resources, if they haven't been mentioned before, so Futurepreneur. Um, Mars Discovery District uh, has been incredible for opening our eyes to a lot of the thought leadership uh, and advisory services. Um, also, uh, the OCAD Imagination Catalyst uh, program, which was another incubator that we were able to, to use to be able to access a lot of their resources. And um, just friends, friends and family. I've had uh, so much generosity uh, that's been coming our way for us to be able to get where we are today. Um, so where we're at now is that we are existing off of sales and combined with my personal lines of credit. Um, so we are uh, just in our fourth year. Um, the thing when you're a growing company and you're a new company, a bank doesn't necessarily yet know you, so they don't necessarily yet trust you. Uh, so we're just now in a discussion between uh, moving things from me personally, using my own personal credit, to the business's credit. And these are just kind of the pain points that happen as you grow and as you build, and especially if you don't necessarily have that, that capital behind you. Um, but yeah, my constant question is, how do I get more toys? How do I get more team? Um, to give you a window into what we've been able to accomplish so far, uh, we are in 1,000 schools in 45 countries. We're also in 100 companies, and these are a few of them. And so uh, they are using our toys to uh, onboard. They're using it to train their leaders, but they're also using them in job interviews. Um, this is what we are currently doing, is that we're actually supporting um, the next generation of toy facilitators, so champions uh, who are looking to teach empathy within their organization or at their school. We are training and supporting them. Uh, and lastly, one of the biggest reasons why it's, it's hard, it's really, really, really hard to start your own business and to get up every day and to put in those 12, 14, 16 hour days. Um, this is one of, uh, this is the last story I'll, I'll kind of leave you with, which is we were just in Winnipeg this year um, meeting with the mayor of Winnipeg and the vice principal uh, of a school where they've been using uh, our toys to start a leadership program and they called it 21 Leaders, and what they did is they took a cohort of students and they trained them on using our product, our toy, to run empathy workshops with other students. And so because they did that, they ended up having an 85% reduction in conflict-based office referrals. So an 85% reduction in the, um, they had a lot of uh, racism and bullying, uh, and this is a program that we're now looking to, to expand and to touch many, many schools. Um, and so, Pieces like that and those kinds of supports, it's, it's so important to continue going back to that as you're kind of waiting at that train station. Um, the reason why I'm still not wearing my own pants, uh, and this might be helpful for some of you in the room who are definitely uh, new or a few years into your business, um, 
when I started looking into this and saying like, are we doing well, are we not doing well, how is this going, um, this statistic was really interesting to me, uh, which is that 25% of new businesses don't actually make it past year one, and 50% don't make it past year five. So that's really scary. <laughs> we are in our fourth year, um, and we're still in that, in that place where uh, a lot of sacrifices, a lot of hard work have to be put in for you to survive. On the flip side, the same statistic says that um, only 10% of businesses that make it past year five um, will die off and then the following year. And so the longer that your company is able to exist and to, to, to flourish, the less likely it is to fail. And so looking at what you can invest and how you can be lean and how you can really get it off the ground in those first few years is so important. Um, so while I know every business is, is different, um, some of the key takeaways that I think could be really universal to those of you who are already starting your own business or thinking of your own starting your own business, um, is it any opportunity that you can get, getting your customer to pay first, and that includes Kickstarter. This model of pay and wait um, might seem absurd, but it absolutely uh, has surprised me again and again, not just with our customers, but the first time we had distributors. I said the exact same thing. I said, that is really great. Can you pay me <laughs> in full? Uh, and then I'll be able to provide that, that to you in a number of, of, of months. And so that's, that's an interesting way to start actually negotiating those things. Um, and on the flip side, if there's any opportunity for you to work with a manufacturer, with a producer, to make sure that when you're getting paid can be as closely aligned to when you are paying for your product, um, those are some of the biggest stresses in terms of cash flow and, and getting your company off the ground. Um, one thing that I keep going back to is that this does take long. This can take a really long time. Um, and so giving yourself that grace is really, really important. Um, and the last uh, one, one of the other things is that your company is alive, so it is living and breathing. So I like to say, like, Blockbuster was definitely killing it at one point. Um, but the world changes. Things change. Uh, things that are succeeding today may not succeed tomorrow. And it's really, really important to know that it's not just this hockey stick. Um, and then knowing your limits. So um, while I was able to borrow clothes from friends and sleep on couches, some of us don't actually have the privilege of doing that. Some of us don't have the privilege of making sure that your fourth company succeeds. Maybe you just have that, that one shot. And so understanding your own limits to decide if you want to bootstrap or if you want to get investors or uh, anywhere in between, uh, it's important to know where, where your limits are. Um, and definitely not just with the work that we do around empathy uh, and our next toy is about teaching failure, but it's about, to, it's about embracing that. The creation process involves a lot of humility and curiosity and having empathy and failure at the core of how you investigate and design and continue to grow your business. It's really important for you to know that those are necessary and that those are going to happen and being able to design for that is, is really important. Um, the la last two things I'll say is um, the idea of an overnight success, absolutely there are stories out there, um, but it's very, very rare. And even when it is an overnight success, um, it's, it, we're at an interesting time now where almost I feel so many more people can start a business, but that's very different than continuing and growing a business. Those two are very, very different things. Um, and then, yeah, the, the last note is really uh, just don't be a jerk. <laughs> Um, I'm definitely in an amazing bubble. Uh, I am working at the Center for Social Innovation where people are working on companies that are making the world a better place. Um, but regardless of you know, what your product or your service is, um, it's really important to know that you are being watched, you are in a leadership position, uh, and if you can just try your best not to be a jerk, uh, it's just gonna make everything so much easier in terms of your team uh, really having your back and your customers really following on that journey. Um, so I couldn't really talk about bootstrapping, and this is uh, my last slide, without mentioning uh, my grandpa. And so him and my grandma actually uh, ran a company for 67 years, uh, and it was, quote unquote, it was bootstrapped, I guess you could say. Uh, they were doing furniture and upholstery uh, in Winnipeg. Um, and uh, when they moved uh, to Canada, they, they'd started that idea. And I remember always having this idea like, oh, they're like so rich. <laughs> and I was like, no, they're not. They just have a business. Um, but they, they uh, very much uh, were, were a lot of uh, an, a big inspiration. Uh, and they just uh, retired. He's 90, over 90 years old. And they just retired about two years ago. Um, so <laughs> he has a little bit of advice. Um, so I'm just going to play this very short video from him. Do you have any advice after almost 70 years of running a business with Charlie? Do you have business advice? I 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> May I ask you a good question? Don't give up. Beginning is only hard. After a while, it gets easier. So that's it. So that's that's the last thing I'd like to leave you with. <laughs>